One thing I will miss about being at university when I graduate is some of the drinking games I've had to do here. Uh, one of the particularly heaviest nights I remember was in first year when we watched Die Hard, the first Die Hard film, and played the Die Hard drinking game. Anyone who hasn't played that, basically that involves drinking every time there's an explosion, a gunshot, someone uses a dodgy foreign accent, someone shouts, get to the roof! Which, if you've ever seen that film, it's pretty constant drinking. However, we thought we'd, we'd be a bit cooler, and we'd drink a shot every time someone fired a bullet rather than a gun. Which is fine until someone whips out their first MK47 and, and they get to drink 80 shots in about 3 seconds. I don't remember the rest of that film. Or the rest of the week, to be honest with you. Um, and it wasn't quite as heavy as the drinking game I played um, recently, which was the Nick Griffin on Question Time drinking game. Which meant we drank every time Nick Griffin said something racist, every time Nick Griffin said something stupid, and every time Nick Griffin said a lie. And then we had to down everything if Nick Griffin said a stupid racist lie. Um, which, if you saw it, pretty meant, meant pretty much uh, constant drinking. Um, it was also a good racist thermometer for you and your friends to see how secretly racist you are. Because if you're there and your friends are buried under a mountain of fosters, um, and you're there with your first can of Stella saying, you know what, mate, I think he's got a good point. You are a racist. Uh, um, also, I, I realise I'm getting older now because um, I received my first invite to a friend's wedding. Has anyone been or been invited to a friend's wedding yet? You, sir. Have you been or been invited? Yeah, it's a bit scary, isn't it? Terrifying, thank you. Yeah, exactly. Because I don't, I don't feel I'm ever going to get married or propose to someone, mainly because I had a very bad experience of proposing to someone whilst playing The Sims. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll give you some backstory. I just moved into the area, and, uh, and, and I met Mrs. Goth, who, who lived by the cemetery, which I thought was a bit weird, but I let it go. Um, and she came around, and we got chatting, and we started having a bit of an affair. Um, we, you know, we, we, we had a lot of interests in common, apparently, so the little icons told me, um, you know, we chatted, watched TV together, you know, I read a book and learned to cook for her, um, and then, you know, I juggled for her, I tickled that bitch for hours, right? And then we were, then we were in love, apparently we were in love, and she, she moved in, you know, we had a baby together, admittedly once, we accidentally both woke up and went to work at the same time, and the social services took it. That's the that's black point in our history, we don't like to talk about it. But, um, yeah, you know, I thought we had enough in common, then finally, it got to the stage where I could propose to her. So I did about four times, and every time she'd say something stupid, like, oh, I, I couldn't possibly answer a question like that on an empty stomach. So, I was like, so you know, I kept, kept trying and kept talking, kept giving her back rubs, everything. Still, she I missed the last time, eight, eight proposals in, got to the last one, thought, this is the one, this is the one I'm going to get Mrs. Goth. And then I wet myself in front of her, and, and it was all downhill. But I tried again, and she still said no, and it, I got so frustrated. And then, oh, I'm ashamed to admit this, but I let her go swimming and I took away the steps and she died. And that, that is why, thank you, that is why I shall never propose to anyone. It's, it's, only, it's only safe. Um, it's also getting to that stage where I've got to start deciding what I want to do for the rest of my life, my career. Um, has anyone done any work experience at school or going on the SAS scheme soon? You. Okay. Right, well, let me tell you. Are there any English students here? Yeah, a few of you. Any of you, like me, a bit shit at spelling? Or if you are, don't do work experience at a primary school. Because nothing tells you that you're shit at spelling like having an eight-year-old girl look you in the eyes and say, Mr. John, how do you spell necessary? And you go, fuck it. N E C M S uh uh How old are you? Uh I'm um, seven and a quarter. You should know how to spell necessary. Go, go. Um, <laughs> we, also, we also had to do this thing called uh, raising aspirations. And um, that basically meant getting kids who might not want to go to university to go to university. Which, in layman's terms, was just indoctrinating children to go to, eight, to university. And, and I'm sure you're aware, eight-year-olds are not interested in university. All eight-year-olds are interested in is holding their breath, putting their heads between their legs, and seeing if they can make themselves faint. Right? And I'll tell you they can. Because there's nothing, nothing worse than having the teacher leave the room and say, you're in charge for a second. She comes back and they're all unconscious. How, how do you explain that? Also, I, um, we had to do these interviews with the kids to find out what they wanted to be when they were older. And one child genuinely told me he wanted to be a dinosaur. Now, that seems like pretty fucking high aspirations to me. You know, if it's something between being a chartered accountant or being a velociraptor, I know which one offers the most aspirations. Um, another kid wanted to be Doctor Who. And I was like, well, that's, that's cool, you know, you can go to drama schools, and there's lots of different ways into doing that, it's, it's an achievable dream. 
And they, they laughed at me and said, no, I want to be Doctor Who. And, you know, Time Lord, all of that versus, versus being a lawyer. Again, I know which one represents the highest aspirations. I think I was dampening kids' aspirations, actually. Um, but yeah, no, there was one particular kid I liked, Ben, or Weapons Fanatic Ben, as I like to call him. This kid, couldn't, this kid couldn't really read very well, but he could make every single weapon ever used by mankind out of paper. I mean, that guy was a fucking origami champion. But uh, yeah, no, he, um, one interesting conversation I had with him, he told me that he had a, uh, a World War I gun that his great granddad had used, and it was in his house in a case, and he thought it was still loaded. Which, which made for one of the scariest show and tells I've ever been part of, let me tell you. Um, I decided also that I'd quite like to work for Pick Me Up magazine when I leave university, because let me tell you, that thing is amazing. Anyone come across Pick Me Up or, or something like that? Mm, maybe not. At, oh, when I first came across it, I was uh, at, at work, where I worked mainly with women, and that was the only magazine I could read down there, that's my excuse. Um, and yeah, I, I thought it was a women's magazine, you know, I thought it'd be full of with women's articles, like, I don't know, how to had a knit, a tampon or something like that, but, but no, 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 it turns out it's actually the, the magazine equivalent of the Circus Freak Show. Um, yeah, you know, like, uh, Doctor Who Adventures comes with Doctor Who. I think this magazine comes with the Jeremy Carl Show. They seem to, to link up quite well. Um, and one of my favourite articles I read in that was, um, Woman Who Ate Her Own Face, right? Which was exactly how it sounded, and there were pictures before, during, and after. Which sounds a bit sick, but I, then I thought, if I managed to overcome the physical impossibility of eating my own face, I would want pictures to show people. Because that is quite impressive. You could be at your dinner party um, with some new friends, and they're all talking about their gap years in, in Borneo, where they taught orangutan sign language or something like that. And you could say, no, once I ate my own face. Centre page spread to prove it. What's been that? Although, the, the story that tops that, I think, I came across recently, which was about a woman who wanted children so much that she tried to artificially inseminate herself using nothing but a turkey baster and sea monkeys. Now, that doesn't really tell me that, that sex education is going the right way in this country, really. I mean, and what did she think that child was going to turn out like? Um, I mean, I'm not a scientist, but I can only imagine it would have the swimming abilities of Michael Phelps and the dashing good looks of Wayne Rooney. Something, something like that. Talking of, of Wayne Rooney, we've got the World Cup kicking off! Woo! Come on, England! Uh, now, a lot of people have been giving Emil Heskey a lot of stick for being in the England team, including me. Um, I've got a t-shirt that says, Caution, Emil Heskey, and it's got a picture of a man sliding in. And I bought that in 2004, after the Euros. Now, in 2006, Emil Heskey, uh, in, in 2010, Emil Heskey slid in and took out Rio Ferdinand, the England captain. Never has a joke topical t-shirt lasted so long. Um, but no, no, I'm, I'm kind of on Emil Heskey's side now, thinking about it, because, um, I mean, Emil Heskey, for those of you who don't know, is the England striker with one of the worst strike rate, one of the worst goal-to-game ratios in the history of English football. Um, and I think, pretty much, Emil Heskey is to football, unfortunately, what I am to pulling. Um, now, I mean, we get, I get a lot of assists. Um, you know, just ask Steve Agotti over there, the man who thinks he's a physical embodiment of the song Mambo Number no. 5. You know, he's got Angela, Pamela, Sandra, Rita. As he continues, you know they're getting more made up. <laughs> Love you, Steve. Um, but yeah, no, no, I, I, I do struggle to, to put the ball in the back of the net, you know, no matter how easy the chance. A lot of the times I find there are, there are some really good goalkeepers as well. They call them boyfriends. But either way, I, I, I sympathise with Heskey, you know. And um, also, I've not had a great football year. I'm a Man United fan. Oh, not so many boos this time. Yeah! We didn't win. Um, however, I was, I was buoyed after the election when, uh, when at one stage Labour were talking of joining with the Lib Dems to win the election. And I thought, well, what if Man U and Arsenal made a coalition? <laughs> Joined points, surely they would win then. Because, I mean, just because Chelsea scored the most amount of goals and got the most amount of points, surely that doesn't mean they should win. I think this election changes competition forever. What if, what if last year Susan Boyle had uh, joined with Flawless, combined their votes and won Britain's Got Talent? Not only would they then be performing at the Royal Variety Show, but we would have seen a fantastic street dance edition of Elaine Page's classic while Susan Boyle sang and body popped. That, ladies and gentlemen, is entertainment. Um, well, I'm pretty much uh, finished up here now, but uh, I've got a joke that I've always told at the end of every set. So if you've seen me before, you'll know it. 
and I'd like you to join along. If not, it's a pretty easy joke. So if you can work out the punchline, I want you to shout it along with me. It's kind of like my angels, as it were. So, um, okay. <sighs> I, would, I would like to offer the guys in the audience some words of wisdom that I've picked up whilst at university. Please never take relationship advice from the Spice Girls. Because no matter how many times they insist it in their song Wannabe, under no circumstances, get with their friends. You are useless. I brought my friends to shout along at that and you are useless. Um, this has been my last ever stand-up get at Exeter. I just want to thank everyone who's come to see me in the past and thank you for being here tonight. Enjoy the rest of today. Thank you, Exeter.